I'm working for a German company, so I have to be very punctual. So uh, it's exactly 10, and we're starting, and everybody who is uh, uh, too late is too late. So I'm working for the company called Codecentric, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. And uh, um, when I'm not working for Codecentric, for instance, like in evenings and on the weekends, I'm doing uh, open source work in Clojure VX. That's an open source uh, organization. We're doing lots of obviously Clojure projects, but um, that's not the only thing I do. And uh, I'm going to be talking about um, learning. The thing is that um, the process of learning and uh, the process of learning how to learn better has changed me as a person drastically, not only internally, but also visually. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to have uh, several pictures of C.T. Fletcher. Who knows who C.T. Fletcher is? Okay. If you don't know C.T. Fletcher, then uh, probably you're not bench pressing enough. And if you're not bench pressing, probably you should. And uh, uh, my first question would be, uh, how many programming languages do you speak? Is there anyone, okay, who does anything, anything functional, like any functional programming language? Okay, and which one of you does Haskell? Okay, exactly two people. That's <laughs> a whole lot. That's about the whole Haskell community. Uh, <laughs> who does Clojure? Uh, and who does Scala? Okay, and who thinks that Scala is a functional programming language? I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> no, okay, and uh, uh, the first question um, that people usually ask me, okay, uh, y you keep saying this uh, learning stuff. Why should I even bother learning? And uh, uh, to be honest, uh, there is no straightforward answer to that question. And uh, usually if I hear it being questioned directly, I say, you probably shouldn't. Because uh, if you think, yeah, why should I bother learning uh, that stuff, uh, probably you shouldn't. Because learning something new is actually pretty hard. And uh, it is uh, hard to switch, for instance, a text editor. For instance, if you're used to IntelliJ uh, and you've been doing Java for quite a long time, then switching to something like Emacs uh, leaves you pretty much with only text editor and there is nothing else. And uh, you have to write half of the IntelliJ idea yourself. You have to um, code the functions that highlight your stuff. You should, well, change the syntax uh, uh, yourself. You should uh, provide the functions which are shelling out and running the test yourself. So it's, it's not that easy. And uh, um, if you're thinking of these things as limitations, so because learning process is basically going through several limitations that make you a better person and make you learn certain new things. If you only see limitations there, uh, most likely your growth will be, um, well, slower than the growth of the people who see those things as something they should overcome to uh, become, well, a better person or better programmer or whatever else. And uh, learning requires you to leave the comfort zone. Even though this is a cliche fra phrase, um, it's still uh, quite true. Because, um, for instance, whenever you're starting learning a new programming language and your favorite constructs are not there, your favorite libraries are not there, your favorite build tool is not there, and uh, uh, you're starting wondering, okay, um, I can't solve the problems the way I'm used to solve the problems, so it, it leaves you out of your comfort zone. But I guess there is no other way to learn. And learning is related to pretty much anything. Even though I try to concentrate on uh, uh, functional programming languages, at least in that talk, it, the same principles can be applied to pretty much anything. A text editor, a programming language, concepts, algorithms, or data structures. And uh, sometimes I personally wish that our industry was more like Jim, right? And uh, <laughs> um, the thing is that people come to Jim in order to change themselves, you know? Well, uh, there are people who just uh, come there for, uh, to unwind, I don't know, throw all the things away from their heads. And there are people who uh, 
try to aspire and uh, go beyond their limits and do things that uh, they were not capable of, right? For instance, I don't know, jumping higher or uh, pressing more or, I don't know, do doing something that they've never been able to do, running faster. And there was a guy who is 165 centimeters uh, tall. Like, who can, can say how, how tall? That, that's about like that, that size. Or I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. That's not too tall for a basketball guy. And this guy has devoted his time to train himself into doing a slam dunk. How many of you can do the slam dunk? OK. <laughs> so just about the, as many people as can do Haskell, right? So uh, we can assume that it's pretty hard. And the thing is that majority of people who can actually do slam dunk are usually taller than 165 centimeters. And jumping that high when you're uh, that big is uh, not that easy. And uh, the thing is that learning, um, we always say that, yeah, we are working in an industry where we can always learn every day. And I don't believe that, to be honest. I believe that if you are hired then, uh, to learn something, then probably you're underpaid. If uh, someone is uh, paying you to only learn new stuff every day, then probably uh, either you're missing something or the person who hired you has missing something. Because while you're learning, you cannot produce actual value, at least at the particular time. It's very hard to do simultaneously. So, and uh, um, there was a guy I talked to about the um, um, memory cache alignment and Java code optimization for uh, the, well, C for CPU. And he was telling me, uh, yeah, right, that's a very interesting problem, but I never had it in my career. I never faced anything that would require me to know how cache alignment or uh, L1, L2, L3 caches in CPU were. Therefore, I never bothered to learn it. And uh, he said, yeah, I would learn it if I ever had a problem. And uh, five minutes later, we were discussing like uh, LMAX disruptor and high performance uh, message queues in Java. And he was like, oh, I'm so jealous. Those guys, they're working on so interesting problems. I wish I could work on same stuff also. And to be honest, that's the moment when I was thinking like, okay, so you're basically saying that you would learn, potentially, if there were a problem at your hand uh, to learn about, but you, you also are jealous about the people who are working on these problems. But the thing is that those people who work on such problems have most likely spent a significant amount of time at home, at their free time, learning about these concepts before they could apply them. Or, I mean, they could have been also C programmers and they could have just known that beforehand, but it's irrelevant. I mean, that's still some knowledge that was pre-existing to the fact of actually applying it in Java, because in Java, it's, to be honest, not as straightforward as, for instance, in C. And uh, most of time, we're getting the tasks uh, that fit our knowledge. And uh, I don't know, if we're working on the web applications, it's relatively straightforward. So make a form, make it the backend work, then connect to the database, and tuck, tuck, everything works. And uh, then like, we start thinking, OK, how can we improve it? And then we're starting stretching our limits, uh, because uh, we're trying to come up with the problems we were not directly given, but still we'd like to solve to, in order to make the software we're working on better. And f at first we implement uh, the, everything we are getting in among the lines that we already know. Um, and uh, sometimes we can theorize or see that, okay, there are potential better ways of uh, solving problems, there are smarter concepts, and uh, sometimes there is something that uh, we never heard of. And um, even if we wanted to apply these things, they are not in our tool chain and they're not available to our, uh, yeah, to us, basically. And uh, the next question from my side would be, what is your dream job? Like, is there anyone who really wants to work in some, uh, like crazy company like Google or, well crazy is not in a bad sense, like crazy is like very big, large and dealing with the um, tremendous scale problems. 
Anyone? Google? Yahoo? No, Yahoo is probably not, not to, anymore, right? It's outdated. I don't know. SoundCloud? They, Netflix? No? No? Okay. It's like same guy wants to work in Google and Netflix. What's, what's wrong with the rest? I mean, uh, if you think of it, Netflix is actually solving very interesting problems. And the outcome of what they do is, well, it, it's very it's surprising, I'd say. Because, I don't know, if you've seen the... Um, uh, pig whatever their language or like uh, in closure pro data processing stuff or chaos monkeys is something that no one has ever come up with like it's really new stuff and it's very interesting like it, you can be absolutely certain that people who work there are absolutely extraordinary and uh, um, like since no one wants to work, I, I just assume that everyone still has a dream job. Probably it's just uh, not Netflix or SoundCloud or Google or whatever. If you can already work there, uh, why aren't you there yet? And if you cannot work there, what are you doing currently in order to reach your goal and work there, for instance, in five years? Because there are some companies that require so much knowledge and so much background and so much, uh, I don't know, even theoretical background sometimes that uh, it's pretty much impossible to uh, do without pretty much getting a second higher education, you know? And uh, I found this uh, little slide somewhere, I don't even know where, but I, I really loved it. I, it, it really was... Uh, driving my life for a couple of years. It's like replace the fear of unknown with the curiosity. And uh, I can say that if we ever settle for the mediocre solution, we will never get there. We will never get to uh, the point where we actually are satisfied with our job and we're doing the things that we were dreaming about. I mean, of course, every day our dreams should move faster and faster or further and further. But still, uh, we should never settle for a mediocre solution. If we know that what we're doing is not good enough, we should not settle on that and fight to make a change, even if it requires lots of learning. The second thing is taking a look inside things. Uh, like if you, if you see that your library is not working, uh, the initial instinct is, of course, Stack Overflow. Okay, what does Stack Overflow say about that exception? And in majority of times, uh, before going to Stack Overflow, if you think for a minute, okay, what the exception is, in which environment and which context it was given to me, and you just meditate about it for a second, you can find the better answer to that problem in your mind. And uh, uh, there were several scientists, I, I'm, I don't remember who it was exactly, I think it was Nikol Nikola Tesla, who is actually pretty popular here. Uh, even uh, he's printed on the uh, Serbish, uh, Serbian money. And uh, he, like wh when he was facing some problem that he couldn't overcome, he took a uh, set of keys in his hand and he sat in his armchair and uh, then he was falling asleep. And as soon as he was transitioning to that uh, state of sleep, the keys would fall and he would wake up with the problem solved in his mind. Because there is like a state of mind right before you go to sleep when there is a clarity and uh, people say that there is access to subconsciousness. I don't want to like uh, talk or speak about uh, changed m m mind states and everything. And that's n not my goal, but uh, just concentrating and meditating on the thing for a while and taking a look inside of things, trying to understand what it does and why it does it can change the way you see things. For instance, how the Linux kernel is ticking. Who has ever taken a, uh, take a look at the Linux or Unix uh, um, kernel sources? Okay, so uh, same, it's like same people doing Haskell and uh, going to gym and <laughs> doing everything pretty much. I mean, uh, there is some overlap at least. And how does my database handle connection? Like who is using, for instance, is there anyone who's using Cassandra? Uh, okay, do you guys know how the Cassandra is pulling the connection on the client side? It's very interesting, think of it. Okay, and uh, or for what it's worth, there can be many things or how the queues work internally, how 
uh, I don't know why Kafka is so fast or why Erlang is so good in dist uh, like distributing stuff. And uh, you can take a look at your code. If you have, like, for instance, slow web request, you can think, okay, how do I make it faster? Or how do I make it smarter? And uh, you should always look for the people who do the stuff that you cannot do. And uh, that is, at least for me, was the key for um, actually starting doing something I couldn't do was first finding the people who already do the stuff I'd like to do, but I can't yet. And I was like, okay, what does this guy do and what's so special about what he does that I could change in my life in order to make that step? And uh, who remembers the hot technology that was uh, um, relevant a couple of years ago? For instance, that. Who, who remembers that? Or Nokia or whatever. You can think of many things. Uh, I, I've taken, taken a couple of notes. I don't know, Flash, Django, ASP.NET Web Forms, right? Or jQuery, M, uh, yeah, Microsoft Foundation Framework. SVN, that's my favorite thing, actually. Or everybody is like, uh, at least in Germany, there, there is a, people are often joking about, about enterprise Java. They say, oh, you work with enterprise Java. So that's, or COBOL, or like there are many things. And uh, some things, for instance, I mean, Java has existed a long time ago. And uh, to be honest, some programming languages, such as, for instance, like Lisp, they in existed a long time ago. C existed like uh, longer than Java even, right? And uh, these things somehow survived, right? And have grown into something. Because the, they had also open standards, or I don't know, in C you couldn't, uh, build like many libraries and they're very useful and people started using it, them and involving them, evolving them. And uh, things, some things have moved on, moved on and stayed actual. And some of them have become completely obsolete and um, some of them even became a synonym for absolute. So I don't know, uh, for instance, when, when you talk of Siemens phones, everybody's like, oh yeah, Siemens phone. I remember that thing. So it's like, it can't be actual anymore. Like even my grandma doesn't use the uh, Siemens cell phone anymore. I mean, she has iPhone or whatever, or at least something more actual, you know. And uh, there is a thing like a hype cycle, right? How the things are evolving. And uh, okay, so there is some acceptance curve. Okay, first people don't know about this thing, and then suddenly it's starting uh, picking up. Okay, everybody talks about it, and it's getting hotter and hotter. And then suddenly everybody wants to use it. Everybody speaks about it on the conferences. Then everybody starts being productive about it. And then everybody starts chilling out. Okay, okay, that was a good idea and I already use it. But I don't know, I'm searching for the next big thing, right? And uh, usually when we talk about the hype cycles, that's where we have to start. And usually it's good to be an early acceptor, you know? Uh, if we're talking about some hot new technology, for instance, I don't know, let's say Clojure. It was really uh, interesting to see how the Clojure community was evolving when it was like super new and super hot and it was uh, taking off. And usually we start over here, at best. Uh, in majority of times we start much, much later and actually some people even start after the technology stopped being relevant, they still uh, try to care about it. And uh, I know that everybody is thinking of uh, um, taking a useful technology that's wide, uh, widespread and used by everyone as a job security. But uh, I don't want anyone to excuse not learning for a job security. Like, <laughs> and uh, a job security should not be misunderstood for I secure myself for doing that job until the end of my life because you will end up as a COBOL developer uh, in the end. And do uh, the job better. Teach your colleagues, innovate, and change your environment. And. Uh, the best thing uh, I've heard or ever heard, that's my, one of my favorite quotes, is like, but no one ever was fired for using Java or for, uh, for buying IBM equipment or whatever. So, I mean, why shouldn't I use Hibernate or Oracle or whatever else? 
Like, like other people do that, and they're doing fine, and they're making money with it, and that's true. But right now, I'm not speaking about bringing profits or big profits to your company. And if you don't know the technology, you cannot make an educated guess about whether it's useful or not useful. So, and you keep, should keep in mind that this quote was actually taken from a Wikipedia article about fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So that's not the best thing to bring into the argument, if you think of it. And uh, I can say that learning new things can change the way you think. And uh, my favorite effect is uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Who, who heard of, of it? OK, we all are sick with this effect or syndrome, whatever. Uh, even if you haven't heard of it, most likely you're still suffering from it. At least I am suffering. I've been suffering it from, from it for a long time. And um, it all has started when uh, I was doing um, C, uh, Java, and .NET back in, like, after university. I started working as a developer, and I started doing pretty much everything in these three languages, depending on the project or combination of projects. And then I was thinking, OK, people, now I know it all. Like, impress me now. Like, I, I've seen it. Like, I've seen everything. Uh, I've learned like three languages, and I, they all look the same. So I think I, I've seen the world already. And then um, everybody starts talking about Python. And I'm like, OK, that Python thing doesn't look like my C code at all. Uh, and I was like, OK, I should try it out. And I started hacking it, and it felt extremely weird to hack Python. OK, uh, I don't have compilation. OK, I can name my variable, and I can uh, not specify the type of the variable. OK, this is dynamic typing. And then there were a whole bunch of different things that were surprising me in Python more and more. And then the Ruby came along. And I was like, OK, I've seen the Python, so Ruby should be straightforward. Actually, that was absolutely true. And I take a look at the Ruby. I was exactly doing the same thing as Python, uh, sometimes better, sometimes much worse. And, but in the end, I've, I haven't seen the major difference. And uh, where was I? <laughs> and uh, then uh, suddenly, I, well, it, the thing is that it was all accompanied with myself thinking of myself that, OK, now I, I've, I've, I've seen two or three, three uh, C-like languages and two Ruby or Python-like languages. And now I have seen it all. Now I am an expert. And uh, like you cannot impress me anymore. I can get any job in this world. And uh, uh, then everybody starts uh, talking about functional programming, right? And then I'm like, OK, functional programming. I heard about it in university. It's like somehow related to the lambda calculus and everything. And just because I know Ruby, I think I can al already do the, um, the um, functional programming because I know map, I know reduce, and I know recursion. So it's already cool. I'm absolutely set with that. And uh, uh, then I talked to several people, and I tried to tell them pretty much among the lines of whatever I told you just now. And they were like, OK, dude, you have no idea. And uh, then I was like, OK, they should be wrong. I'm so smart. I, should, I knew it all already. It can't be that I can't just start hacking closure. So I downloaded the Lightning and I started hacking closure. And people, it was absolutely confusing. I couldn't do anything, pretty much. So. Uh, like everything uh, was an expression, and uh, I was I couldn't even uh, start my like write the most basic things. So uh, I couldn't write a variable and store the state into the, this variable, and I should have like done it all via recursion. And uh, like when I couldn't do this with a standard map, map and reduce, I should have written my own loop recur statements and just like write my own uh, functional code kind of. And then I was getting really, really stuck. And uh, well, th what helped me a lot is, uh, OK, probably I should talk about this later. <laughs> and then um, I'm, I'm just trying to, to talk about this Dunning-Kruger effect. And then I thought, OK, a closure is cool. So I've seen at least one uh, functional programming language, so I, so I should try Erlang. 
And I was like, okay, Erlang, you cannot impress me. They're like, I know everything about functional programming. And then they have this pattern matching thing, or even binary pattern matching thing, and they have much more powerful list comprehensions, and they have this whole OTP thing that everybody is so excited about. And it turned out that, well, I once again don't know anything, despite myself thinking that, okay, I'm already set and uh, it should be very, uh, I should be very knowledgeable by now. And probably the worst crash in my life I've had when I've seen Haskell. Uh, because at that time, like if, if in any other language I could do at least the most basic stuff like print line, you know, hello world and stuff like that, in Haskell I could not do anything because even, even I couldn't do I.O., I couldn't print things to the screen because it was ev evolving this I.O. monad, which I was like, what the hell it even is? And uh, then I started understanding that I've been deluding myself all the time that I actually know things. And uh, I've been concentrating too much on the things that I've been knowing and I've been thinking that Okay, that's enough. That, that should be cool. And uh, then I, I started thinking, what else do I not know? And uh, suddenly my mindset has changed and uh, I started actually discovering big holes in my education, in my uh, theory background, uh, programming language theory background, in general IT background, in mathematical background, and many other things. So. I was not anymore thinking of myself as capable and knowledgeable, but I was thinking of myself as the person who has so many problems with his theoretical. Uh, that's so bad that this talk is recorded because, like, my employer can actually hear that, you know. <laughs> um, so the basic thing that I wanted to communicate that learning is really hard. And it's probably as hard as bench pressing. Or, um, and at first in university, we kind of figure out how to um, learn stuff. And then we almost completely forget how to do it. Well, by the end of university and especially a couple of years after it. And uh, there was a um, guy. His, his last name was O'Neill, Paul O'Neill. He was uh, working for United States Treasury, uh, part of the uh, George W. Bush uh, president first term. And um, he was also working for a local company. It is uh, a large anim aluminum, aluminum <laughs> manufacturer in United States. They've been uh, doing cans for Coca-Cola, I think. I mean, pretty much whatever you can think of uh, was related to aluminum was their job. And uh, he uh, once uh, started working, once he started working for this company, he said, okay guys, he was a CEO of it. And he said, there is only one thing that is important, it's safety. Like there is nothing else we should concentrate on. All the divisions, everybody from top to the bottom should only concentrate on safety of the people. There should be absolutely no people who should suffer at their work. There should be no one, absolutely. And uh, it took them a long time, a couple of years, but uh, the actual benefits started showing up even after the first couple of months. So the productivity has increased. So people started working more, started working better, and started having well better quality time at their work. And uh, um, this, this uh, quote was taken from uh, the book on, well, Power of Habits. And uh, the general idea is that our habits are forming us. And as soon as you have habit, be it concentrating on safety or learning new stuff, you are becoming, starting to become a different person. And uh, it will start spilling into the different parts of your life. And uh, you will be surprised how well it works. And best learning requires quiet, relaxed environment. You cannot really learn under stress. When your boss is saying, okay, when is going to be done? Like, are we there yet? You, you remember the Shrek movie? Uh, no? Are we there yet? Uh, 
So oh, probably not, but never mind. Uh, and uh, if, if, if you, you can learn under these circumstances, you're amazing. I really want to learn your secret sauce or secret techniques. I cannot do that. I should be absolutely relaxed when I learn something new. And uh, uh, that's why I try to dedicate special time for that also. And uh, my advice is always start with something very small. Always track your progress. And uh, to be honest, like when, when I first started realizing these things, a couple of years ago, uh, I was not only thinking differently, I was also looking differently. I was like the same way or uh, the same height I am right now, but I had like 20 additional kilograms in my, on myself. And uh, to be honest, I tried everything. I, I tried dieting, tried gym, tried everything. And I was like, OK, nothing works for me. So it's like genetics. So I'm just built that way. And everybody should live with that too. And uh, it turned out that the simplest trick that started actually making a change for me, and it's, it's not that the gym or dieting wasn't working for me. The progress was so minor that I wasn't noticing it on a daily basis. And I was quitting before the progress was showing uh, and starting spilling out in the different parts of my life. And as soon as I started tracking the progress, I took the notebook. By today, I have like three note notebooks with uh, filled up with top to the bottom with the, uh, all like the training programs and everything I do uh, in gym every day and everything I eat and calorie intake. I uh, and like pretty much whatever you can think about. And only then it started showing. I started seeing the progress and it started stimulating me to make more progress. And I would say that you can apply pretty much same things to learning programming languages or functional programming languages. For instance, like forget about the state. And if you're approaching the functional programming language, just don't try to impose state in your program, you know? Because we are all used to have an object which has some thing that we can like uh, call a setter on it and it will, the object will change. But reality doesn't work that way, right? So, I mean, the change of the things, I mean, it changes uh, with the, the fact that observer is, well, seen. So it's like quantum thing, right? And, uh, Okay, perfect. Um, and get used to the fact that everything you're used to can be more or less gone. Well, first of all, it will inevitable, inevitably happen to you uh, whenever the technology you love, cherish, and use will become outdated. If you already hate the technology that you're using, it's a completely different story. I mean, you can suffer as long as you want uh, because it's your life. but. Uh, loving the technology you're working with is, um, for me, like the, the one of the most important uh, parts in the life also. And uh, like when you start working with the functional programming language, you see that, okay, there are the, all these new things. Everything is an expression, recursion, functions, functions, functions. And the easiest thing is to start approaching this thing from the vocabulary. Just learn whatever the people are saying about this language. Okay, uh, what, what are the words that are, they're using and what these words mean and how they could possibly translate to the already existing vocabulary. It's like uh, learning another foreign language. And don't r rush yourself to write the blog in five minutes. You remember this Ruby and Rails thing wh whenever they were like, okay, now you can write the blog, blog in, in five minutes. And actually, I was never buying it. Well, except for when I was trying to learn Ruby. <laughs> and if you can learn it all in five minutes, why is it even worth to learn at all? Like, if I can Google it in five minutes and take this answer and copy paste it to whatever, like, I, I shouldn't even learn it, right? I shouldn't even memorize it. I sh it it's not worth the memory if it takes only five minutes. Another thing is, if you're learning something more complex, prepare to just grab a notepad and always be writing. Because, well, um, people who used to program with 32 uh, kilobytes of memory in RAM, 
know what I mean. Your memory capacity is limited. And for humans, it's exactly the same way. If you're trying to remember or memorize everything, it's gonna, not going to work. And why did we, or were we so diligent, and why did we write all the things when we were in university, for instance, and why do we think that, did we get so much smarter, or did we get younger and our memory suddenly got better? I think every, everything is opposite. Our memory got worse, our learning skills got worse, and right now we should actually be more diligent than we used to be in university. Maybe our concentration skills have improved because we are, well, pretty much concentrating all day long. <coughs> Try to learn the syntax of the language in the context. Try to find the visual patterns in the things and memorize the, uh, those patterns. Try to talk to the people about what the thing means and try to get it into your head. Read the code from other people. Uh, well, my, my really good, good friend of mine, he, he um, used to be a MERB committer. It's like something that got merged into Ruby on Rails 3. And uh, once I've heard his presentation, it was in 2008 uh, in Ukraine on like Ruby conference. And he was saying, um, read other people's code. It's really worth it. Like, I read the code on a daily basis like a book. I open up the code and I start reading it from top to the bottom. And then I try to understand the concepts. And there are actually several books written about architecture. There are even groups in internet of people who are reading the code together. It's like pretty much like reading a Bible, just reading code, you know? There, there are groups for reading the Bible and groups for reading the code. And, uh, and learn the tool chain, how the stuff is built. Like if you're used to Maven or Make, like okay, you, you get to Erlang, where is my Maven? Maven doesn't work in Erlang. Make, well, Make kind of works, but you don't want that, at least in Erlang, at least uh, not for everything, or in Haskell especially. Uh, then there are other tools that are used within the tool chain of the Erlang, Haskell, Clojure, and other programmers. So learn it. And start checking the stuff on the REPL. You know, read eval uh, print loop. You know, whenever you can actually open up your text editor and uh, without compiling anything, without actually, mm, well, writing a whole program, you can just try smaller things out. and. Uh, if you don't use a decent text editor, start using one. And uh, to be honest, uh, for me, uh, like the Sublime and uh, TextMate are still um, like toy, to toy things. I mean, I've seen that they can edit three lines uh, simultaneously. Let me surprise you, Emacs can do that too. Like, it's really easy. And uh, by the decent text editor, I mean the text editor that can, you, you can easily configure. I mean, if you can really configure your sublime and really write extensions for it, I'm completely cool with it. I mean, probably it's the tool of your preference, of your choice, and you've got to be very productive with it. But if you cannot extend your tool chain, if you cannot extend your editor, you're screwed. It's going to be very, very complicated for you to go beyond uh, the languages that you already use in your tool chain. Find the ideas that you get excited about. And if it's too hard, if you feel that, okay, this Haskell shit is just like so overwhelming, um, I can't fit it into my head. That's what, exactly what was happening to me. I like, okay, monad, applicative, and oh, like, okay, is it that direction or this direction? And I was like, I can't take it. And uh, you, know, you remember that American Beauty? No? Like, I can take it. <laughs> uh, okay. And um, if you quit, if it's too hard, then you pretty much have lost all the effort that you have invested. And only quit if it's too easy. You say, okay, I can, I've seen it, I can do this, so let's move on to the next better, more interesting thing. And is it learning for sakes of learning? Maybe, in a way. But I think that everything that we're learning if, if we approach it uh, pragmatically, we can actually learn for... Um, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, yeah, and for you also. It's like, I know it's been boring. Uh, so uh, it, if, for the sakes of learning, in a way, yes, but 
if we can actually figure out how to apply these things, which is another talk of mine, how to convince people to use better tech, <laughs> um, then we are not learning for the sakes of learning, but we are learning to grow into something. Don't expect things to work um, this certain way. Get engaged with the community. Read the actual books, not that, um, yeah, you know, learn C++ in a week or whatever. That, that stuff doesn't work ever. Only read the book, real books that challenge you. Even with closure books, I would say that there are like seven books that I, I've seen and I could only recommend like two of them because they, only they are speaking about the concept that are worth reading in the book. The rest you can just hack in five minutes and you rapple faster than reading the book. Read the scientific papers because oftentimes, well first of all, uh, there is a myth that scientific papers are written in a complex, uh, unreadable language. Well, except for these signs that you can learn like in five minutes and you can easily Google, there is absolutely nothing uh, hard about them. Usually, for instance, uh, there is a paper uh, done by Facebook guys uh, about Haskell um, parallel framework. It's called, there is no fork. It's written so simple that, I mean, it, it doesn't even require uh, Haskell experience to read it from top to the bottom or raft paper. It really only requires you to concentrate on the thing and try to memorize uh, the sentence, like the way it started until you read it to the end. But it's, it's no brainer to read them. It's really useful and easy. Join some open source project. Don't uh, search for the maintainer that will actually accept your patches like Peter does, right? Because uh, like if you're wasting your, or you feel like you're wasting your energy and no one like, is appreciating your work, you will also eventually quit. So join some open source project where you can feel like that. And uh, being a fast learner is anti-fragile. Anti-fragile means that uh, it's like fragile but the opposite, right? And if, if the resilient things can survive the failure, then anti-fragile things can benefit from the failure and get better. And market wants you to persist. It demands the um, signal from you that you're serious, powerful, accepted, and safe. And in majority of times, this is only a delusion. Because as soon as the things go wrong, it's going to be all gone, and you're going to be well left with everything except for anti-fragility that I have told you about already. And uh, quit the wrong stuff, uh, stick with the right stuff, and uh, get guts to do one or the other. Staying up to date is a decision, and stay positive. Thank you. And we have exactly two minutes or one minute, uh, 45 seconds for questions. But we can also, uh, should we just skip the questions and uh, people can come and ask the questions if they have them. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> okay, I'm not even offended. Never, nevertheless, I mean, um, I'm going to be here all two days, so um, please ping me. Okay, please. I don't think you explained what Dunning-Kruger effect was. Okay, Dunning-Kruger effect is that... Should I Google it? <laughs> um, Dunning-Kruger effect is when... Uh, okay, everybody thinks that he's above average. And that's pretty much like how the effect works. And... Uh, a Dunning-Kruger effect is overestimating the power of whatever you know and thinking and exaggerating the fact that you know something and uh, undermining that if you don't know something, you just say, yeah, I don't know, but it's also not important. Uh, so that's kind of uh, the, the Dunning-Kruger effect easy way. But you can read the Wikipedia article and Daniel Kahneman's uh, books about it. Uh, like he explains it a lot and I really advise it. Uh, the thing is that uh, developers like to think that they don't have this effect. They do, unfortunately. So it, it's called human. Yes? So you, you mentioned that uh, we should track uh, 
progress. So it's easy for the yeah pumping the the weights. Yeah. <laughs> what about uh, how you can measure the progress of learning? Well, uh, the thing is that, uh, once again, with, with the programming language, it's relatively easy because you can feel the pace with what you're moving. So you're kind of, like Peter was saying, shoving off uh, tasks your own direction, and you can see how fast you can handle the tasks and how, well, what, what's the subjective quality of, of uh, the result, the outcome. That's, well, one way. And uh, the second way, if you're studying something more theoretical like mathematics, you can also see, like, the way um, well, I, I would say that um, like writing diary these days is something sissy, right? Everybody's like, yeah, writing diary, you know. But like Blaise Pascal, for instance, he is famous for writing the diary, right? There is nothing wrong with just saying the way you feel about certain things, about certain uh, knowledges, and being explicit with yourself about it. And if you s can say that, okay, yesterday I didn't know how fast Fourier transformation works, and today I know it, it's easy to track the progress. It's binary zero, one, and you're pretty much done. And with programming languages, it's much easier because uh, you can see, well, the, the velocity that you're moving with. So. Is it the only word? I mean, is the only measure, the velocity, how, how fast you're learning? Um, it's hard to say. For me, it was pretty much the, the only thing. Because, I mean, that, that was kind of uh, was the purpose of my learning, and uh, that, that was the only thing that I bothered to uh, count for myself. But I think everybody can find his own thing. Thank you.